Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be going over how to fly the Cabri G2 on this nice little training helicopter from France. Now we've uh, featured this helicopter quite a bit in the last few weeks, kind of going over the intricacies of flying it, so that's not really going to be my concentration here. My concentration is going to be more on things like procedures, navigation, stuff like that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, we climb in this helicopter. Uh, for those of you who've tried this thing in VR, you'll realize there's no right place to sit. <laughs> you know, you can come in here, you know, it's like, ah, oh, how do I get out? And your, your face is up against the windshield. And uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting too, is if you put your, just kind of visualize where your legs are right now, kind of hanging out right here. Look where this control is. And notice it is not in the center of the screen. The center of the screen is actually over here. So little tiny things like that, it's like, it seems like it's not gonna be an issue, but when you see it, you gotta see it. So first things first, uh, before I even start going nuts with the individual startup procedure, I just want to go over a couple buttons that people probably are we're not aware of. Uh, the first things first is if you turn your head around, uh, you have a couple options here. We have our ELT, of course. We have our fuel selector. This is uh, turning everything on and off. We have our collective over here. On the edge of the collective is going to be your throttle. Uh, one thing I want to warn you about the throttle here, by the way, is this is linked to the pitch control of your actually your prop pitch, I should say. It should be more specific. So for example, if you push your prop pitch, that's the blue hand all the way forward, you're going to see the throttle come up. You're going to pull it down. You want to make sure you either have that bound to something or you can come over here with your mouse and you can kind of do the little whole thing with the finger where you go like that to control the um, throttle here. Now, for those of you with a collective at home, uh, you're the very, very few. Congratulations. I uh, just want to make sure that your uh, collective is set down and you want to make sure your throttle is set to zero. Another thing we want to take a look at too is if we just pop over here, we have a classic GPS. This is a 650. Really nice piece of equipment. Over here, of course, we have our transponder. I'm going to leave those all alone. You have your volume controls if you need to. We have all of our important switches right here. A couple things I like to tell people. Now, one thing's for sure is uh, they have this wonderful anti-ice feature here. It is a fantastic feature. Uh, one of the mistakes I made in the very early days of operating this helicopter is forgetting you could set the carburetor heat to be automatic. Um, you're probably saying, carburetor heat? Wait, what? Yeah, this helicopter is powered by a piston engine, which means that all that lovely stuff going on back there has all the limitations of everything with a piston engine. Uh, here we have our digital display. You also have a bunch of warnings across the top. I really appreciate the fact that on these style, they're very, very clean. You know, this is the warning for this, is the warning for this, is the warning for this. Again, this is one of those systems where if any of these lights are on, uh, we have to start panicking. Floating up above our heads, whoa, I'm looking out into space here. There's a couple different switches here that we need to kind of be aware of. Uh, the first one we're gonna have right here, this is gonna be a mixture handle, yeah. This is the mixture. This is what you think of when you think of a mixture like you have on an airplane. The other one is this thing called a rotor brake. If I pull this back, what it will actually do is it'll cause the rotor to stop rotating. Notice, unlike a lot of rotor brakes, if I hold it down, it stays there. But the moment I let it go, it releases itself. This isn't a set and forget rotor brake like you get like on a Bell 407 or something like that. We also have our cabin lighting and we have these two funky little switches here, which I find kind of interesting. Uh, one, of course, is our magneto. The other one is the engine plasma option. Uh, that basically is going to be, uh, if you want to think about it, a, a magneto plus plus it's sort of like the boost switch that you get on old engines the other thing we have up on the ceiling which is a super duper handy here which i actually really like is they have this little thing to go ahead and let you know speeds you cannot exceed at certain types of situations i like how it says power on that simply means that you're under load uh, come down here if you power off you lose 20 knots so that simply says that if our normal altitude is zero feet and 130 knots if we completely cut the power we're looking at 110 knots as our vna we don't want to overspeed the rotor just kind of one of those things and also i love the fact you can put on motor gasoline in it. All right, enough chat. Let's get this thing rolling. So first things first, we're going to make our way down to our panel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my throttle. I'm going to put it all the way to zero, and I'm going to crack it just a teeny tiny bit. Again, I'll have to jank it too much. We have the master switch. We're going to go ahead and pop on the strobe lights to let everybody around us know that we're about to get started. I also like to pop on the nav lights just to be kind of a nice guy, but you don't have to. We have our fuel pump, and we also have our alternator, too. We're going to go ahead and pop those on. You can leave the alternator off until after the engine gets started. It's one less electrical load if you want to think about it another way. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come up to our little digital display for a kind of engine. This is like our IFS kind of a thing like that. A couple buttons. Unfortunately, we, they're just stress keys right now, which is really a because there's actually some things in here you can turn it on and off. You can adjust your total fuel and things like that. Stuff we want to pay attention to, we have a power gauge over here on the left. We also have a little heat gauge. We also have a warning of our battery. We're on the low end of uh, kind of high sort of thing, all of our different temperatures, and our RPM. Our RPM is actually split into two different things here. And if you look really carefully, see this little kind of like lavender colored needle? That is our engine RPM, which if you notice, peaks at 3,000. This white guy is our rotor. That's the big thing above our head RPM. When that gets all the way up here, 
we want to keep it somewhere between, uh, let's say, 530, 540, somewhere right in there. Again, this is a very tight range. But here is going to be our fuel, and notice we've got some big unhappy warnings here. Starting this thing is a gas. It's very, 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 very easy to do. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to confirm that the clutch is off. We don't want to start a rotor with an engine at the same time. That would go bad for us. Make sure our throttle is cracked. And what you're going to see right on the front here is you're going to see this handy dandy little starter switch right here. This is our governor. We'll deal with him in a little bit. <laughs> the governor. So we're going to use this button to get the process started. But to do that, we're going to come up here and make sure our mixture is full rich. I'm going to slap that up like that. And we're going to turn in both of our magneto switches here. Magneto comes on. Engine plasma option comes on as well. So the system is now primed and ready to rot. Look around. Uh, clear rotor. Clear rotor. Clear rotor. And we're going to go ahead and crank it. So cranking it pretty darn simple. All you're going to do is you can come back here and you have this little button that says start and you just press and hold it. So I'm kind of a lazy guy. I have a switch for it on my keyboard. I just push it. And you can see the engine comes up. We're now going to use our governor just gently. And you can see I can adjust the engine power just by playing with the throttle. So if I sit here, I can go give it a little bit. I don't have to crank it too much. Obviously, remember, this is still an old-fashioned engine here. We don't want to be too rough with it. So I'm just going to have it kind of settle right in this range. This is about 1,000 RPM. Uh, that'll be pretty good. So what we're doing now is we're just going to let the engine tail warm up just a little bit. Again, this is pretty old school. You're going to get a lot of warning lights and stuff like that. Obviously, our governor is disengaged right now, so that could give us a lot of problems. The governor is not going to engage until we get into the governor range. Even if we turned it on right now, we don't have to worry about it. One thing we want to take a look at, though, is our P's, T's, and E's. And make sure everything's fine. Obviously, carburetor temperature is very low. We come in here, we can flip it to the auto position. The carburetor, temp, see how the heat came on automatically and warm that carburetor up? Keep in mind, when the carburetor temperature increases, that's going to reduce the power. Uh, we're just trying to keep ice out of there because we're very low RPM right now. Well, the temperature is fine. Oil pressure is fine. All those other things are looking pretty darn good. So now what we're going to do is engage the big old rotor above our heads. So the engine is going. So this is a bit of a process. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure our collective is all the way down, really important. And we're going to engage the clutch at the same time as slowly manipulate the throttle until we can get the engine, the rotor into the green range. Now, one thing you really want to watch out for is if this thing wants to jump on us you got to be real quick on the right pedal there to make sure it doesn't run away by the way we do have a train which i think is really cool so let's go ahead and engage the clutch so what that's going to do is it's going to make our rotor time now what you want to watch is both these needles at the same time you want to make sure that our throttle does not or I should say our engine rpm doesn't suddenly drop off on us and you want to also make sure our rotor rpm is coming up on its own so see how it starts to stall a little bit? You give it just a teeny tiny tap. If for some reason it starts to fail, you'll get a warning here that we have a bit of a power drop. You can just smoothly increase the throttle. And you can see we're getting about 11, 12% power. The rotor's coming up. Notice our lavender thing is coming up in front of the rotor, which is exactly what we want. Nice and tight. Now watch what happens to all of our pressures here. I'm continuing to bring in the throttle very, very gently here. I'm not doing anything excessive. Notice how high of an RPM you have to get this thing to go in order to be successful. Looks pretty good. Starting to come up. Oh, don't need 50% there. That looks pretty good. Bring it down. You can see the two needles are more or less locked onto each other. Remember, we haven't engaged the governor yet. All right. Now, theoretically, you could fly this helicopter using just the rotor and the, without the governor. Now, that is a lot of hand-eye coordination, actually hand-hand coordination. So when this thing starts to get a little high in the RPM, what I do is I back the throttle up just a little bit. Remember, we're using the throttle to control our rotor RPM right now. That looks perfect. So you can see we're right in the middle of the green range. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come on down here. I'm going to go ahead and bop the level, uh, lovely switch for governor. And when you do that, get ready to catch it. Perfect. You can see it barely tweaked. Oh, there it goes. And now, as you can probably observe, our rotor RPM is stabilized in the green range and our power keeps fluctuating, which is actually good because our governor's job here is to go ahead and make sure that this is all kept in the proper range. Whoa, careful there, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Don't freak me out like that. Um, by the way, one thing you want to watch out for is if you have a noisy joystick, like uh, you can probably just see that mine is, your governor will be fighting against Microsoft setting for it, and that could give you some issues. All right, this is all set. Go ahead and close it out. We can go pop off anything we need. Carburetor's fine. Wow, that's hot. That is way too hot. But um, again, I'm not the one who programmed it. We have ourselves now a little estimation of how much fuel we have. So I'm going to go pop up our handy dandy GPS. Like I said, this is a really, really nice unit. Very, very simple. You can see we're down here in Gibraltar. Uh, the reason I chose it is because I want to do a quick donut around the rock and come back kind of a thing like that everything else is all set we're going to flip on our transponder to the altitude setting that's looking pretty good so the first thing we want to do with a helicopter after everything's running and again we've talked about this in existing videos is we just want to make sure whatever our initial our rpm is or i should say our amount of collective is going to be required in order to get this thing off the ground so because this is a french helicopter the rotor goes the other direction to american helicopters which means as we apply power we're going to be applying right foot 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take our collective and we're going to just slowly push it upwards. Again, we don't want to do anything crazy here. What we're trying to do is get the aircraft a little light. See if I press the pedals, how it's getting a little light. Now, one of the things I was shown now with helicopters is you always do this little J. So if I pull the, the yoke of cyclic back, come to the right and up a little bit, this position right here, kind of this, um, what do you want to call this? I just want to call this northeast is going to be your default position. Now, because, like I said, this is a French helicopter, we have to go northeast. In the U.S., we'd be going northwest. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to smoothly apply power. And we're just going to see what RPM this helicopter wants to lift off the ground. And it feels right around 65 70%, which is about what we would expect. Whoop, got that nice little crosswind. So what I want to do is I'm going to flip this around here. Again, you want to do these maneuvers about half the speed I'm doing right now. And we're just going to go ahead and line ourselves up just like that, and we'll make our way over to the runway. Go ahead and stick that nose down. Look how beautiful that rock is. That's so cool. Now, on a helicopter, uh, when you're on the ground, I should probably stop talking and uh, concentrate on my operating this thing. But oh well, too bad. You're going to have to deal with my twitchiness because of it. We want to go ahead and just keep the thing relatively low. Again, we've got a pretty nice little crosswind there. Now, one thing you're probably observing is I have that little red string that's just sort of chilling in front of the helicopter there. That particular device there is our little slip string that's going to let us know if the helicopter is flying coordinated. Now, the reason that's really useful to us is as we start kind of traveling around, we can just look at that and use it as a quick reference. We could also use that little black ball that you see there, or a little turn slip indicator. Now, because a helicopter does not have adverse yaw, when you turn with it, the key to keeping everything centered is just making sure that you have yourself in a position where uh, we're not excessively skidding. And you'll see exactly what I mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring myself around and line myself up with the runway here. I just love the fact somebody decided to put a major road through the middle of a runway. There's many different ways to make a helicopter get airborne. Now we're going to use the most straightforward tactic here. We're going to take advantage of the translational lift. Come on, line ourselves up. That looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and smoothly apply collective, and I'm going to just tilt the helicopter forward just a little bit. Now what makes this real fun is the field of view that you get. In the real world, you can just look out the window. And we're just going to beat that translational lift speed, which is going to be right around 35, 40 knots. And all of a sudden, the helicopter just goes up and I haven't even touched the collective since. Now, see that string that's starting to go all sorts of crazy now? You're probably going to notice if I push my right pedal, the string goes more to the right. If I push my left pedal, you're going to notice it shifts back towards the center. Now, because helicopters have what they call a weather vane effect, all I have to do is apply just enough force to keep this thing centered. As a matter of fact, if I let go of my pedals completely, you'll notice it just puts us a little off to the side. Also, what the heck? Look at that boat. <laughs> that's incredible. All right, let's go ahead and head out here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick little donut here, simple maneuvers. Now, in a helicopter, like I was mentioning, uh, you don't have to push the rudder pedal, which we don't have. We have anti-torque pedals at any point for that particular purpose. We'll come over to the right just a tiny bit, and we'll just start making our way up here. Now, uh, one of the things I always think of is there's a really fun James Bond movie called The Living Daylights. And uh, in that movie, of course, they have a great little scene here in the Rock of Gibraltar, which, uh, you know, they go driving up the side of this road. And, of course, uh, somebody ends up, you know, getting shot at, and there's all sorts of fun like that. So now that we have this thing going, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, just getting around. So first things first, uh, one thing we always want to remember is our power gauge. You can see right now we're hovering right around 68%. That's 68% of max. Now, if I take my collective and I slowly push that forward, you'll notice that I've increased the power demand of the engine. You'll also notice the helicopter started rising up pretty much immediately. We're now using 86% or 85% of our rated power. Also notice that the RPM didn't change. Oh, that's the job of the governor. If we didn't have a governor, we'd have to do this all by hand. And this would be a, quite a process. We're climbing pretty well here. We're getting about, uh, I can't even estimate. Let's see here. It's probably about six, 700 feet per minute if I had to do a quick guess. And if, of course, if I just slowly increase the collective even more, you'll notice that our power demand goes up. Now, our max power is 100%, so right where I had it just a second ago. Now, it's worth noting that on helicopters, our tail rotor is linked to our top rotor on this particular version. So if I were to suddenly go ahead and start pushing down on the right pedal, do you see how my power usage goes up? If I were to release the right pedal, notice my power usage comes back down because we're using the energy from it as well. Let's go ahead and do my quick little donut here. I'm going to get a little warning. We'll come swing around. You can see some of the nice, pretty buildings there. Uh, the rest of Spain, of course, up that way. Now, helicopters, uh, when we want to cruise, all we do is we tip them forward. So I'm going to go ahead and tip my nose forward just a little bit. And we're just trying to basically get our vertical speed to be zero. That looks pretty good right there. Now, because we are at such a high power setting, and because we are at such a forward tilt, this is where it's going to get us our speed here. My joystick is almost all the way forward right now, and I'm doing about 90 knots. Now, these particular aircraft, you're probably sitting there going, well, we'll just use my pitch trim. You don't have 
pitch trim on this particular helicopter. So if you want to trim it, you're going to have to have some function on your joystick that enables you to trim it. What you do have, however, if you actually looked at the handle earlier, is we do have yaw trim, which in this case, uh, see how we're kind of traveling a little off to that side? If you have a device on your joystick that allows you to adjust yaw, you can actually sit here and crank it and use it to kind of cancel out some of this uh, nastiness that we're getting off to the right here. But again, it doesn't make that much of a difference. When we're cruising, uh, generally we're not going to be cruising around at 100% uh, power. That's usually not pretty healthy. Uh, you can, of course, cruise 85 and 75% or less is going to be optimum. That's also going to be a lot less work for you at the controls. So now for the weird part. How do you make a helicopter go down? Uh, the first things first is you just sit there and you would just slowly pull the collective down to nothing here you'll notice the helicopter will start descending rather rapidly. I've actually put the helicopter collective all the way down to the floor. Uh, what you're also probably noticing is as we're diving like this, so we're gonna start picking up some speed. You're also gonna notice that our RPM of the collective rotor, is, or the rotor itself, is gonna start spinning up really, really, really rapidly, which is kind of dangerous. And yes, we are dropping probably, I don't know, I'm gonna call this 2,500, maybe 3,000 feet per minute, it is not the most comfortable for passengers. And the real danger here is I want to go to smoothly apply the collective to bring in that torque so that I can go ahead and level off. You're going to notice that all the RPMs start going nuts. The engine power starts freaking out. And my passengers in the back seat are probably throwing up and ready to uh, pretty much quit flying for me. So it's one of those things where when you want to descend, just gently reduce the collective. Uh, you can even nose over. Speaking of nose over, another thing you never want to do in any helicopter is you never want to just push forward on the control as hard. If you do that, that lovely rotor will continue its own a little position and the rest of the helicopter will rotate up to meet it meaning you're going to get this um let's just say decapitation of a certain critical part of the helicopter required for a stable flight here so what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to continue my little journey and we're going to bring it back up to our little airport and we're going to set ourselves up for landing landing is the exact same thing if you want to think about pretty much as any helicopter we want to identify the direction that the wind is traveling in and we want to line ourselves up with the wind there's a couple different ways we've done that in a previous video like i said i'm not going to stress about too much critical thing with this thing is that when you do enter into a hover you just want to make sure that you don't get too too slow if you get too slow of course uh, in the real world you you could enter into what they call vortex ring state, where you basically descend into your own turbulence. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and smoothly reduce collective. I'm just going to bring up the nose of the helicopter, and I'm just going to go ahead and take myself a nice gentle turn. Notice, of course, as you start to reduce speed, that little string is going to go nutters on you. Don't worry, it'll do that. A little bit of right foot. And we're looking real good now. I'm going to swing myself around at big old 2.7. What I usually tell people uh, when you're trying to learn how to learn the helicopters it's, it's okay if it's not smooth the first couple of times. You know, in the real world, when you're landing on a nice uh, North Sea oil rig and it's really windy, there's really very little you can do. Uh, the important thing you want to remember, though, is as you get close to the ground, you're going to get the rotor and ground effect, which is going to act as a strange little cushion. So what you need to do is arrive down to the ground into that effect and be ready for it. Once you've entered into that weird little cushioned area, one thing you also need to remember is as I make any adjustment in pitch, it's going to cause my altitude to change as well. So that always surprises people. You know, I pitch up just a tiny bit to slow down, and that causes my altitude to actually increase a little bit. I'm going to bring the nose up. We're just going to go ahead and level off. And we're just going to settle into the ground just like that. Now, when you settle into the ground, of course, remember you're still flying the helicopter, so you want to go ahead and smoothly reduce the collective. And we've reached our destination. Shutting down is uh, relatively straightforward for this particular helicopter. Again, there's uh, not too, too much drama involved. One thing you want to do is confirm the position of the throttle there. Uh, some people, of course, would say, what happens if you shut off the governor? Well, let's find out what happens if you shut off the governor. We click that switch off. Now, of course, if I pull my throttle to zero, you'll notice that the whole rotor mechanism immediately begins to slow down on itself, which makes sense. Now, if you wanted to make that a lot worse of a situation, of course, what you could do is you could push the collective up, which causes it to bite a bigger chunk of the air, which, of course, causes it to slow down a lot more rapidly. The other thing some of you might say is, uh, can't we just run up here and grab right on to the rotor brake? Yeah, you're not supposed to be using the rotor brake at RPMs this high. That's uh, kind of, that's bad for the brake. You can do a lot of damage. But notice just how much inertia this particular rotor carries with it as it's going around. So we're going to go ahead and shut this engine down the same way you would normally do it. We're going to reach up top. You've got your mixture control. We're just going to pull the mixture like that. And we're going to wait for the engine to come to a complete stop. So what's going to happen is you're going to watch the engine lose a lot of RPM. Remember, these are still mechanically engaged with each other. So we can disengage them by hopping the clutch right there. So now they're disconnected from each other. Uh, once we've got that off, of course, we can reach up here, shut off the engine plasma. And we can also shut off the magnetos. And now the engine is completely disengaged. What we're going to do now is we're going to wait for this rotor to go ahead and slow itself down a little bit. There we go. Now what we can do is go ahead and engage our rotor brake.
Now, this particular rotor brake, it's a press and hold rotor brake. Uh, this is not the style where we can just go click and leave it. It's generally considered bad form to leave that gigantic rotor rotating uh, when you get out of the helicopter. Once you've stopped, you can go ahead and unclick it, and then uh, you're pretty much ready to rock. You can see everything set here. I'm going to go ahead and disengage some options here. Where this has been disengaged, battery pump, master, click, and enjoy.